Okay, I'm Steve Roberts. I teach political science. I'm introducing Matt Fouts. He is a, a double major, uh, sociology, and then he realized he needed to get a job, <laughs> in it, so he double majored in government. Of course, that's a joke. Um, it didn't go over very well. Uh, Matt's, going, <laughs> Matt's going to talk on uh, uh, Horatio Alger, a name that most of you have never heard of, but a man who was critically important in developing American culture, even today, over 120 years, 30 years later, uh, the books that he wrote have had a profound influence on each of us in this room and our thoughts about American culture. So here's that. Um, okay. How do I get this to go up there? Um, push what? It's not what I wanted to do. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Roberts. As he said, my name is Matt Fouts. Uh, I will be talking to you about Horatio Alger and the American Dream. I'd like to begin talking about what exactly I mean by the American Dream. By this, I'm referring to the idea that in America, as long as you work hard, you can rise to the top of society. You can become wealthy. You can have those rags to riches stories. That is what America has become very well known for. Throughout the 1800s, and even still today, we've had countless numbers of immigrants come into this country with the idea that they can better their social circumstances by coming here and working hard. This has been called the land of opportunity. And a lot of this has been because of the ideas of individuality that the United States really, really believes in, and this Protestant work ethic. Really this idea that if you work hard and you do good things and you are moral about it, not just doing good in your job. You need, even if your job is not one that you would really enjoy doing, say a garbage man, you still work hard at it and you do your job well because that's what this country desires from you. That is what I mean by the Protestant work ethic and the American dream. Now Horatio Alger was one of the greatest proponents of this idea. He lived from 1832 to 1899 and this was really during the time of the Industrial Revolution when people really started to move toward the larger cities and industry really came about and there was a great deal of social mobility that had not been seen before this time. He really was interested in the morality of people. Initially he was a Unitarian minister um, in Massachusetts and due to various allegations he was actually, he ended up uh, being kicked out of the church and moved to New York where he began to focus a great deal more on his writing. He ended up writing hundreds of books on this idea of if you work hard, you're a good person, you will succeed. Um, really he focused a lot on this idea of social mobility that you can be born into a poor family, become, even in being an orphan, and you can rise to the top of society and do well. Um, this idea has actually become known as the Horatio Alger myth. This idea has been debunked countless times, so I won't go too much into that, but one of the largest, probably the best known book he wrote was called Ragged Dick, and it had four, the four characteristics of Horatio Alger and his story. You must have hard work, morality, there's always the presence of a benefactor, and there's always a presence of luck. So for instance, in Ragged Dick, uh, Dick is a 14 year old shoe, sh eh, shoe shiner, excuse me, in New York City. And he has some vices. He, he will drink and smoke on occasion. However, he is morally opposed to stealing. This fierce opposition to stealing is really what helps several gentlemen who are wealthier help to uh, give him aid for, in order for him to better his situation. One of these individuals actually took him to church to help improve his morality overall. And another gave him $5. With this $5, he started a bank account and he was able to rent his first apartment. Now, here's where luck comes in. He was uh, fortunate enough to, or misfortunate enough, I guess you should, I should say, to witness a child drowning in a river. He jumped into the river to save this individual's life, and he succeeded. Now, luckily, this individual's father was incredibly wealthy and was the, um, pretty much the CEO of a large firm. And because Ragged Dick had risked his life 
to save this man's child. He actually gave him a job, and uh, Ragged Dick uh, changed his name. Well, he went from going by Dick to Richard and had and significantly bettered his situation. He had more money, more wealth. He was not completely wealthy, but he was significantly better off than he was. Now, this idea is hundreds of years old, so why is this relevant today? Because we're still seeing this idea perpetrated now. Uh, we'll take the film Aaron Brockovich, which came out in 2000. Um, Aaron Brockovich was a young uh, single mother who dressed provocatively, to say the least, and some could say she might even be considered white trash. Um, and because she wasn't in an accident, she was able to get in touch with a lawyer who she asked if she could work for this individual, which she did as a clerk, uh, doing a lot of filing, kind of menial work. Um, and through this, she was able to, she found one case that she was very interested in, and she wanted to pursue this further. And by pursuing it further, she actually uncovered a great deal of corporate irresponsibility, which led her to sue a company and win millions of dollars. She went from being at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder to going very close to the top. This is that whole idea of rags to riches, and you can do it if you work hard and you're, mor and you're moral about it. She wanted to right the wrongs of a company. Another one that, we, that many, of this, yeah, many of you in this room, I believe, would know is the idea of the little engine that could. Um, I believe many of us have heard the story of the little engine trying to go up the hill, and I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And it's really this idea that if you just work hard, you can do it. Even if the odds are far against your favor, you can still do it. So, one example of this being perpetrated even today is The Hunger Games. Um, it's one of the biggest selling films out there right now. Now, the reason why this is probably one of the best examples of the Horatio Alger myth is because it takes the story of a struggling young woman who is put into a life or death scenario and she's able to come out on the other side alive. This is because she is incredibly hard working. Uh, throughout the film you see her working incredibly hard just to survive. <coughs> Additionally, she is moral. Um, in this scenario, these children are pitted to fight to the death. She does not participate in this bloodshed unless she absolutely has to. Um, the first time her actions led to someone dying is when she was cornered and the only way she had out was to drop a hornet's nest on other individuals. Uh, by doing so, one of the individuals hunting her was killed by the bee stings and she made it out alive. Additionally, the first time she takes a life it is in order to try and protect her younger companion. And the final time she takes a life, it's to end someone's misery. They are being eaten alive, essentially, and so she puts him out of his misery. These are all moral examples of when it would be right to kill someone. This individual has a great deal of morality in her. Additionally, there is a presence of a benefactor in this, in this film in the book. Uh, if these individuals are able to convince people to like them, they can have sponsors, so to say. And these sponsors can send them uh, care packages in the form of medicine or any other thing they may need. Uh, she is burned early in the film and she receives medicine from uh, an unnamed individual to help her. She does have the aid of a benefactor. Additionally, this idea of luck is prevalent as well. There is one point where she is trying to get medicine for one of her friends and she is um, She's knocked to the ground, and the only reason she is able to survive the, this encounter with one of the other uh, children is because this individual was friends with the young companion that she had helped throughout the film. So she was lucky in the regard that if it had been anyone else, she would have died in that scenario. However, it was not, so this young man granted her, her life in this one scenario. Um, the reason why I bring up these examples in the media is because when you're watching TV, sometimes you have your guard up and sometimes you don't. If you're watching the news or you're seeing political campaigns, you know exactly what they're trying to do. You can see their message. It's not that hard to see. But if, when you're watching TV shows or movies, it is a lot, you let your guard down. You really are not actively trying to um, pretty much 
not take these ideas into your head. You really are a lot more restrained. Um, really don't want these ideas getting to you as much. But when you're watching TV or you're being entertained, you don't have those same shields up. You're not that resistive to these ideas coming into your life. Now, why is this even a problem? Because it's, it's in our culture and it's been a major part of, American, of the American ideology for so many years now. Um, really, the biggest danger of the Horatio Alger myth is that if you truly believe that you can do anything through hard work, if you truly believe that, then what that means is that poor people are lazy. And if you just, if you are on the impression that if you're poor, you just need to work harder, then you're not going to have any desire to create any kind of social safety net for these individuals. Without the safety net, many, many people would fall through the cracks. And you are always going to have those uh, outliers of people who do abuse the system, but most people do not. Um, you have the individuals who are laid off of their jobs in the factories and have a hard time finding another job. Are they, are they poor because they are lazy? Are they unemployed because they don't have any morals? No, it's because of drastic social circumstances. So the biggest danger of the Horatio Alger myth is that it can really create a great deal of loathing and even hatred for the impoverished and the poor, which really does not help the situation in any way, shape, or form. Um, that is my presentation. Do you have any questions? Yes. Uh, sorry, could you say that again a little bit louder? Out of those four factors, mm -hmm. which would have the most impact on most of the people that are um, successful? I would say luck. I would say luck is the single greatest reason that people are able to rise up out of lower uh, social classes. Because a lot of the circumstances, a lot of the social circumstances, that are, or uh, social institutions, sorry, that are in place really don't provide that much social mobility. It's really a pretty big guarantee, uh, actually our generation will be one of the first, to really not necessarily be able to live up to their parents' standards. Most people go to college and they will take jobs in similar uh, paying levels that their parents did. Uh, our generation is one of the few that will, do not have this luxury just set in stone. So we are one of the first to pretty much prove it as an, uh, me, prove as an example against the Horatio Alger myth. Is it? Um, okay, so in today's politics, do we see this even in, um, when they do campaigning, their speeches, even when they get into government, do we still see this in action? See this idea that if you work hard? Mm -hmm. uh, you really do. A lot of the idea, well, you can kind of go back a couple years with the, um, or let's just even look at the uh, Occupy Wall Street. Um, Movement. You will have many people who will just shower these people with McDonald's applications, pretty much saying, get a job and quit being lazy. Um, this idea is very, very prominent throughout all of our culture and very, very prominent among the Republican Party to an extent because they're the ones who do not favor uh, social welfare systems nearly as much. Any other questions? In the back? Would conceptualize social welfare programs? Um, I think that he would see them as a handout and to people who don't necessarily deserve them. I, I, I really do not believe he would look favorably upon them whatsoever. I think he would say that they would result in coddling people and that they really um, prohibit people doing better on themselves. It really restricts self empowerment. That's what I think he would say if he were to look at the social welfare system we have today. So, um, in your perspective, is it more of a benefit to have this idea of the American dream and picking yourself up? I think it's actually very detrimental to our society because what it does is it creates this um, polarizing effect between the middle classes and the poor classes. Um, because when you have this idea that oh, you're just not working hard enough. You just need to work harder and then, you'll be, then you can be like us. That's not, that doesn't really work. It's more of the fact that they're in jobs that are not paying as much. 
because they work much longer hours, I would argue, and much harder labor than middle class families would. Um, I don't think that there's any real standing to this, which is why it has been labeled the Horatio Alger myth. But in certain circumstances, it, you always have the rags to riches stories, which is why this is still around today. All right. I have another question that relates to Dr. Roger's introduction to you. He mm -hmm. said that this myth still dominates in our society and impacts our lives. Mm -hmm. How do you think that's true? I know that you went through the litany of the popular media, but how about internally? How does that motivate us as individuals? Well, internally, I believe that uh, many of us are instilled with the idea of hard work when we're young, when we're young, and this idea that. Um, you can even see this in what parents will tell their kids. You'll have kids who say, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be the president. And the parents will say, you can do, you can do it. If you just work hard and, do, and, and you work towards your goals, you can do anything you put your mind to. So a lot of it comes from just the socialization we experience in our families. Um, aside from that, you have the political factor, um, where you have one party that will often put a lot more emphasis on individuals they just need to work hard. They need to just pick themselves up by the bootstraps and get themselves out of the situation on their own. But they, the reason they're in that situation is because that hasn't been working for them. So I think there are several examples. Those are just two. How about corporate expectations for workers, executives, um, Could you clarify that a little bit? I, I just want to make sure I can answer the question as best I can. I think that is a great example of that because Horatio Alger believes that you need to be moral and you need to be, you can't be resistive against where you are. He has another uh, book called Tattoo Tom. Um, this is the example of a young girl, Jane, whose guardian is abusive and she is not to rebel or run away, excuse me, from this uh, abusive guardian, but to kind of endure and persevere and get through it by do, by working hard and getting yourself out of these situations. So from the corporate level, yeah, that's, that's a great epitome of the Horatio Alger myth. You just need, yeah, I hired you, so therefore you should work as hard as you possibly can to improve this company because that's the right thing to do. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, a major argument about <laughs> social um, stratification and any kind of welfare or safety net. Horatio Alger is a great proponent of capitalism and working hard. Uh, Marx is the um, antithesis of that. He completely disagrees with that, believes that you need to have a classless society. So it would be a massive debate about that. And yeah, it would be hard to see who would win because I don't think either one would really make any ground with the other person. Any other questions?